Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the EU Circular Talk on the Circular Textile Design. Get it right from the start. It's really a pleasure to have so many of you here. We have two and a half hours of very exciting time ahead of us. My name is Lars Mortensen. I'm from the European Environment Agency, and I will be moderating uh, this morning. Uh, I will, uh, would like to thank the organizers for putting this together, and would like to thank all of you who are jo have joined or are joining right now. Please keep your microphones uh, off uh, when you're not uh, speaking. This will be an interactive uh, seminar, so if you have questions, please write in the chat. Uh, speakers will answer in the chat or I can give you the floor, so please don't hesitate to do that. You can also raise the hand and, and I will see how to, uh, to, to, to get you in, into the discussion uh, then. Uh, and uh, when you speak, please turn on your camera so we can see uh, who you are. So to start uh, the day, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Kilian Lo Lohan, who is Vice President of the European Economic and Social Committee for uh, opening uh, this very, very exciting morning. Kilian, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lars, and I'm delighted to be here. Thanks as well. I'll add my thanks to yours of the uh, for the organizers for bringing forward such an important topic and an exciting um, event ahead, I, I think. We all know already that the transition to circular economy is essential for a more sustainable and more robust European economy. And at the European Economic and Social Committee, we've recognized that bringing stakeholders together is a really key way to drive that type of change. And that philosophy is why we joined forces with the European Commission and launched this joint initiative known as the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform and um, one of the, the co-hosts of today's event. And this platform, I think, is best described as a one-stop shop for the circular economy community within Europe and also, as we're increasingly seeing, even beyond, um, beyond Europe. And it's a place for uh, dialogue and for sharing ideas. In fact, the content on the website, website comes directly from the stakeholders, which I think brings a huge added value to it. And the debate is continually being nourished through online communication channels, such as Twitter, LinkedIn, and a newsletter that is uh, circulated and exchanged. And um, I think as the exchange concept of the, of the circular economy stakeholder platform, these circular talks are uh, an ideal forum for all stakeholders to come together and share ideas and practices and, and learn uh, from each other. And that's exactly, I think, what we and the European Commission working together had in mind uh, when we launched the, the platform more than four years ago now. Um, it's driven by stakeholders on the ground, as I said, and this is why uh, the initiative by ECOS, OVAM, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, Eurocommerce and Policy Hub to focus this circular talk on circular textile design is particularly welcome. We know that textiles are the fourth highest pressure category for the use of primary raw materials and, and water, uh, following on um, after food, housing and transport, and they're fifth for greenhouse gas emissions. So it's estimated that less than 1% of all textiles worldwide are recycled into new textiles. So we can see the huge opportunity that is there um, in the sector. The EU textile sector, which is predominantly composed of SMEs, has started to recover after a long period of restructuring. And it's important, I think, to note that 60% by value of clothing in the EU is produced elsewhere. So bearing all of this in mind, um, at the ESC, we've made a, a number of different recommendations, um, encouraging a, a thorough overhaul of aggregation and networking policy, so stepping up cooperation within the chains, uh, focusing particularly on the roles of SMEs and strengthening synergies between the various stages of the production process and between production and the distribution and supply chains. This is something that we see across so many different sectors within circular economy. And we've also um, acknowledged the, the role that innovation can play in this space. And it's also the reason why we've called on the Commission and the Parliament to put in place financing to foster innovation and workforce upgrading in the sector. Um, so there's, there's a lot of um, common recommendations for the textile sector 
that go across to, to other sectors in circular economy um, also. But apart from an active role in the platform, the committee has also called for clear policies and financial support. I think that's the, the key message. And, and recall that the practical implementation of the circular economy is going to require a high level of cooperation with stakeholders. That again is the reason why I think this stakeholder platform brings that added value and is important. So these different type of messages echo the recommendations that we made concerning the 2020 circular economy action plan. Um, and to turn these messages into reality and, and to close with my intervention, the move from policy to practice, exchanging circular good practices, research and strategies are key. And this is at the heart of what the platform delivers for stakeholders. However, for the stakeholder platform to be more useful to a wider audience beyond the active stakeholders, it needs more practices, as many as possible, to in exist the um, to enrich the existing range of good practices that are there for circular design in textiles. And with stakeholder-driven content on the website and a growing community on the social media platforms, I think regularly uploading these good practices is essential to keep the conversation going and avoid repeating um, the lessons learned and, and learning from each other. Very briefly, to give you an example of two of the really good best practices that are up there, we have Better World Fashion, which has a 98% um, use of upcycled materials. Uh, as their kind of tagline says, 98% reuse, 100% unique. Um, and this company transforms used leather and discarded plastic bottles, uh, recycled wood and metal into brand new leather jackets, bags, aprons and other products. And also in the textile world, uh, an Italian example, of course, Italians renowned for, for fashion. We have the Quid Project, which is a sustainable and ethical fashion brand there. that uh, I'd encourage you to check that out on the website. They combine the circular element with the, with the social element also by um, providing jobs for, for vulnerable people uh, within their company also. So we can really see there how the um, the technical, the material side of the circular economy can overlap with the, the social side of it. So I really look forward to this, the discussions today and um, hearing all of the different interventions and learning from each other. And I leave the floor now to, um, to Lars, today's moderator, and wish you a very fruitful exchange. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for a really, really good and clear introduction. I think you really highlighted why textiles are so important. Uh, and also, you know, the need for policies and, and practice coming together. And that's exactly what we're doing today. So I, I hope and believe today we will actually make, make a difference in, in terms of what will happen in real life. And, and I think that's, uh, that's really great. So thanks, thanks a lot to you. So with that, we move on to, uh, to Paola Miglorini, who will set the scene for us. Paola is uh, Deputy Head of Unit in, in DG Environment. Uh, uh, leads work on textiles and Paolo we're really really happy to hear you especially I know you're on vacation so you are so dedicated it's really fantastic you you will spend an hour half an hour with us today to uh, to tell us you know how, how you see this so so I think that's really really great I want to thank you for that and uh, yeah basically give give you the floor to so give you an opportunity to come up with something we take a few questions afterwards and then you're you're free to to continue your your vacation <laughs> Paolo the world is yours Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars, and then good morning, everyone. Allow me to start by, by thanking um, again and then uh, underlining what uh, Kilian has said. So thanking the organizers of so the work of the platform, some of the representative of the coordination uh, group of, um, of the circular economy they called the platform, which precisely we set up several years ago. And I'm, I'm very pleased to see how active and then how uh, right to the point of the the initial objectives, uh, this uh, this platform is is going. It was precisely um, the the main aim was to collect and to engage further the stakeholders. So going outside what we used to call the Brussels bubble, and then trying to reach out and having good practices on one side, but also extending the you know the formal consultation that we always have with the Commission. Uh, on our own proposals. And this um, series of circular talks, I think this one specifically on textile is already the second one of, of a series on, on, the, on that. So I'm very, very pleased to, to be here and once in a while update you where we are 
with the strategy, which brings me to the point that I we all know that I think uh, most of you were expecting a strategy by the end of this year, as it was announced. In fact, I I have already uh, communicated was already communicated in in several exchanges that we will have a few uh, weeks and months uh, of of delay in order to align with other initiatives. But I will say a few words on them because there's a specifically very very specific point on the articulation of the content of, of the strategy and the other initiatives that makes it important to align the adoptions um, with, with others. But um, what I really would like to, to focus my intervention today is on uh, repeating and clarifying the, the aim, the rationale of, for the strategy, what kind of document it will be, because I hear that there might be some expectations and I really prefer that uh, we are we're clear on, on what uh, we are planning to adopt. And then going into more details on some content, and then again, as I said, uh, provide a few details on the articulation with other initiatives. So I'll uh, probably be happy to answer some some questions on on that because this is what I I'm receiving most uh, most of all. So the strategy will be a document, a communication that uh, I think is uh, highly expected from the sector. There will not be an announcement of new measures per se in the strategy, but it will be a document that will set a general framework of what the sector can expect or will have to abide to uh, in um, in the next months for uh, for legislations or what are the availability in terms of voluntary tools in order to make the the sector um, and the businesses more more sustainable so what does that mean um, allow me to go through a uh, step by step or a structure of of the document um, as uh, all the, the documents of the commissions related to circular economy, we are taking the circle. So we're going through the different phases of circular economy. So we will uh, present the, um, the different steps going from productions and consumptions and, and waste and then recuperating the, the, um, the valuable materials and secondary raw materials and see for each of these steps what are the measures that the Commission has in place or will have in place. I'm thinking, for example, of the beginning, so design. Um, the strategy will present the, um, the measures that will, uh, will be adopted in the, in the coming future on um, the topic of the day, so how to make design more sustainable. It means uh, what would be the measures for recycled content, for example, uh, preferring some um, uh, materials, looking at the impacts of the material choices and, and so on, uh, having some essential requirements, for example. But again, it will not be a document that will have provisions for recycled content. It will announce what we have foreseen for that. Uh, thinking about consumptions, the, the strategy will recall that we have uh, um, available the criteria for the eco label, for example, and the green public procurement uh, criteria that are going to be uh, revised based on the uh, PEF, uh, very likely the PEF methodology, so the product environmental footprint methodology <clears throat> and the category rules that are going that are being developed for apparel and footwear. And I think I saw in the program. Uh, you'll be talking about this also in the course uh, of, uh, of the day. And then you, we will recall the measures for waste, uh, waste prevention and then waste management. So I remember that uh, in the uh, beginning of 2025, uh, the separate collection of textile will be mandatory. We know that in some countries it has already started, so we will have to face some issues of uh, disruption, I must say, of, uh, of the waste management of textiles that is currently ongoing in, in countries. And for this, the Commission is thinking of making available more resources in terms of funds and regional funds for infrastructure, for example, because this is where we, we see the, the largest need. Uh, this is for one, one part of the strategy. There's another part, another sector, section, that uh, will address the research and innovation. Uh, needs and then supports made available through the different uh, uh, research and innovation programs. I'm thinking also about uh, supports for skills development and reinforcement of, uh, of the skills in, um, in the sectors that, uh, as it was uh, mentioned, uh, it was uh, severely hit by the, the pandemic. And then um, there will be some um, uh, links to the measures foreseen for uh, the international 
uh, sphere. So I'm thinking about some uh, waste, uh, still waste, um, waste shipment regulation revisions that will address also that will impact uh, the, the sector of, uh, of textiles. And at the same time, we are trying to see how we can um, extrapolate the work that we did with plastics at international level, but do the same for textiles. So trying to see and you know engage the inter international community to address uh, textiles. I don't have to tell you that mm, the largest part of the production is happening outside the EU borders. So the, uh, the issues of international, I would say, is more than central to to the, the topic. Uh, one um, novelty I can say uh, about the strategy it will be the um, a sort of a call for awareness and for further participation of stakeholders and businesses through the transition pathway. It's a document that will be uh, that is mainly um, adopted or developed by uh, our colleagues in DG Grow. But at the same time, you know, as everything in the Commission, we we worked uh, hands in hands uh, with uh, with the development of policy uh, policy documents. So the transition pathway will call businesses for further uh, discussion and further uh, engagement in order to identify how they can reach some of the targets that uh, or aspirational targets that might be set or their own commitments of the businesses. And uh, in parallel to this, we are also calling for a cultural shift, so um, engaging youth on one side and trying to address uh, fast fashion. So the, the two main uh, um, uh, channels, I would say, for this call for awareness that we want to, to launch also with, uh, with the strategy. So a big movement that will, will engage uh, different, uh, different kind of, of stakeholders. So this is, in a nutshell, what the strategy might be looking like when you will know all this. Uh, as I said, uh, we have decided to adopt it towards the um, in the course of the first uh, first quarter of 2022, together with other initiatives. And here I'm uh, about to speak about the sustainable product initiatives. So the main initiative on on products uh, uh, related to circular economy for this commission, I I must say, it is foreseen also uh, so for the first quarter of 2022. What is the articulation between the strategy and the SPI? Um, the strategy is saying that we will apply the requirements or the provisions of the sustainable product initiatives to the textile sector. But in March, when we will adopt the SPI, which provisions will be applicable to the textile sectors? Probably just the horizontal principles that the SPI is going to bring forward. So principle about durability, recyclability, um, repairability, and, and so on. So a general set of, of principles. Um, since the Sustainable Product Initiative works as the Eco Design Directive, so with work plans and um, specific products to be addressed by what we call implementing measures, so additional documents that uh, sets specific criteria, for example, for recycled content, we will have to wait for these specific measures to address the, sec the sector. So you need to, if we're talking about timing, you need to expect by 2023 any specific legal measures uh, related to um, design for, uh, for textiles because we will have all the course of 2022 and then 2023 to discuss with the stakeholders and determine and having um, a research and impact assessment to determine which essential requirements will be uh, applicable to um, textiles, depending on the product at this point. So not anymore just the sector, but, uh, you know, textiles uh, for, um, uh, for the house or uh, textiles for the automotive sector. So depending on where the textile as a... As a, as, a, as a product is um, is used in, in which context. So you understand perfectly that any measures on recycled content, any percentage will depend on which product we are talking about made of textiles. And so for this, you need to wait 2023. Um, the other initiative uh, that, uh, are, um, that is very uh, closely linked and expected, I, I know, by the sector is the initiatives on microplastics and the one on microplastics for textiles. By the end of 2022, uh, we have announced, and then uh, President von der Leyen has uh, repeated in, in her State of the Union uh, message in, uh, in September, end of September, 
that we will come with an initiative to address microplastics, uh, unintentional release of microplastics by 2022. So we have launched, we started a study in the course of the summer of 2021 to um, quantify and, and see what are the best options to address microplastics released by uh, pellets, tires and textiles. So in parallel, you know, and I know most of you know, because we are also consulting the stakeholders and the experts. So we are we are all the same family, if I can say so, working and everyone bringing their own part of knowledge to uh, solve and then to come to um, a large framework of proposals and that uh, that addresses the different uh, the different issues that we have in front of us. Um, again, this is in a nutshell what uh, I really think would uh, will help to to clarify. I'm very happy to hear that the the work of the platform continues in collecting the the best practices. I think that is something that is is uh, highly in need uh, of every sector, but specifically of um, of the textiles because. Uh, as it was said, uh, the textile sector is made of uh, SMEs, but also large companies. And then this exchange of best practices, solutions identified for new materials or for new business models is really something that uh, uh, we are uh, we're looking forward uh, to in order to, to make this big uh, step change and this cultural shift that I was announcing at, uh, at the beginning. So I would leave it there, Lars, uh, give uh, the floor back to you and then available for, uh, for any question. Thanks a lot, Paul. It was really, really nice to hear how clear, clear your minds are on what is coming now. It's very good for us to hear. You know, it's a framework. Uh, what what the rationale is, and and it will include you know what's already in place and what may be in place. I think that was really nice. I uh, also, of course, the link to the SPI, how important that is. I think it's really important for everybody to understand, and I think it was also for me even clearer to do. So that was that was really nice. I noted your mentioning of the of you know how to extrapolate it to the international agenda. I think that's really important here because so many of the impacts are embedded, you know, and you, I know on plastics, we're moving towards a global agreement and, you know, a dream scenario could, could be to have some something global on textiles as well. So that, I think that's really great. And also your initiative on microplastic is really, really important. So there's a lot coming. I think that's uh, that's really great. If you can stay with us for maybe five minutes, Paula, then there are some questions in the in, in, in the chat uh, that, that we would like to, 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 to bring in. Maybe I can just start with two questions. Uh, I think these are expected questions. I think one is, is from Walter on, uh, is there anything coming on the e extended producer responsibility, a vision there? And one is from Rebecca Ugler from Sweden on, on what about the eco design? So maybe if you start with, with, with those two, I think it'd be nice. And then there's a few more questions. Now I'll ask Valeria to come in with those. Okay, yes, so absolutely the extended pollution responsibilities, we, we know it's something that is expected, but uh, we still are, we're still working on it. Um, I must admit that there are some um, um, hurdles to, to overcome. Uh, we all know that there are several uh, systems at national level that are in place, and then we have received a call to uh, elevate them at the at European level if you want, but uh, it's quite complicated. So I think that if we um, currently there's nothing specifically for extended producer responsibilities provisions at European level that is foreseen. But I think uh, um, you know the we are still at a level where we are looking at what functions at national level that could be elevated at European level. We have we we are receiving and and um, myself with my colleagues in talks with uh, with organizations that uh, that have uh, very interesting proposals for this. But precisely, it's uh, we are relying a lot on the experience of uh, of extend of VPR schemes in other sectors and the ones that are currently existing. And then, if you know, in 2018, we have um, we have revised the waste legislations. And for EPR schemes, what we managed to do was simply very minimum requirements. Um, because everyone, it, it's one of those conundrums where everyone seems to be in agreement that we need to do this. Then when you come to work on it, then you only are faced with differences. And so you know how difficult it is at European level to come up to something. So you invest a lot of um, resources, a lot of work them to, to come to very minimum uh, solutions. So I think we needed to invest more, 
part of the discussion in the transition pathway will also and so this this um, uh, continuation of uh, of consultation and coming to uh, commitments with industry uh, will uh, will address that uh, currently i must really admit that there's nothing foreseen um, for uh, you know moving forward to a european epr scheme but uh, i think that um, maybe we should devote a specific uh, <laughs> secular talk to uh, to that as well, so to move a little bit the consciousness uh, everywhere. <laughs> I think so because it's really really difficult the EPR. That's, that's, what about the eco design, Paula? Uh, so the eco design again, as uh, as I was saying, um, if you think about the reflection on uh, the sustainable product initiative, because for us eco design equal the SPI initiative. Huh? So that's uh, any measures on eco design will come from that. Right. Um, so, as I said, uh, extended and further uh, targeted discussion to start once we adopt the initiative, so from March onwards. I think you can expect, again, a screening of measures for recycled content, depending on the product. Um, I'm completely sure that there will not be any indication of preferential material for sure because this is not uh, the, the 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 way to go um, but uh, I'm expecting a lot of discussion on uh, uh, something that was discussed in the past you know the mono material or trying to uh, facilitate then the uh, the recycling and then the reuse of uh, of the um, product afterwards so uh, combination of of materials that are either easily dismantable or um, more homogeneous if you want in uh, in the type so these are the um, the two aspects uh, i wouldn't put business models in the eco design but there's also a big push to work on on business models so we just need to see again uh, for those uh, that know how the um, the, um, the eco design uh, directive works, you know that in this implementing measures, you can have a variety of measures that actually extend to the specific just eco design per se. So we need uh, we really need to see uh, what will be granted already at horizontal level, for example, for reparability and availability of um, of reparability services, also for for textiles. And um, what then will not make the horizontal level and will have to go into the more specific, uh, uh, let me call it vertical measures, the implementing exactly. measures, okay? Thanks. Okay, what I'll do now is just give the floor to Marin Florian and then afterwards to Valeria, just to summarize a few of the questions. And this is the last round, Paula, and then we will uh, we'll let you go back to enjoying your time, not talking focusing all of your mind on textile policies. Huh? So, uh, so, so Marin Florian, you raised your hand as far as I could see, right? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will be very short and I will ask, uh, what about uh, working conditions, collective bargaining uh, in the textile sector? Because it's really a problem in the sector and uh, we will see some remarks in the, in the, in the textile strategy regarding to these issues. Because it is a big, it is a big uh, uh, debate right now in some member states. I'm representing workers. I'm here uh, representing uh, the committee, uh, European Economic and Social Committee. But I'm coming from Romania, and in Romania, it is a lot. <laughs> it is a lot of tension due to the fact that uh, the textile uh, workers uh, are not uh, are not uh, capable to uh, to join a union. Uh, uh, the, the working conditions are re are really bad, and the salaries are really low. So what about this? Uh, we will tackle in the in the in the in, in the strategy. Thank you very much. Thanks. Before before I give the floor back to to you, Paula, can I just bring in Valerie and see if there if there's a question or two more in the chat that that Paula can perhaps try to answer right now? Yes, uh, Larsa, there is somebody that is asking what about digital uh, product passport and whether that will be uh, included in the strategy and also more overall. I mean, you have mentioned the global dimension, but also how to tackle. Um, the environmental and social aspect outside Europe, and whether that will be specifically uh, spelled out in the in the strategy. Okay. Okay. So um, yes. Uh, so these three things. Uh, let me start with the the skills. So yes, the strategy is uh, 
uh, addressing the, the need for skills. Um, and it's actually following up on the high level round table that uh, was organized by Commissioner Schmidt and Breton uh, with uh, some specific stakeholders um, that uh, announced uh, a sort of a, a large scale skills partnerships that will cover all the sectors. And then we'll start with a blueprint of what, what are the specific skill needs. And then as often, and this, uh, this will be also the, the case, the Commission will follow up with uh, financial supports um, once it has identified where are the weaknesses of the skills or where the, they can be uh, strengthened. I'm thinking about, for example, skills for um, uh, repairing or sorting or the recycling of textiles, or, but also reuse. So there's a... Um, there's a big call for uh, the, the new business models in the strategy. And then looking at clothing as a service. Um, so developing the skills needed to run these business models and then also to uh, take all the opportunities of the secondhand marketplace is something that uh, is going on for uh, forever, I must say, you know, the, the secondhand uh, marketplace. But in a different uh, setting. Um, so maybe less uh, the, the pure economic, it was more highlighting the social elements. With the strategy, we want to give an impetus with uh, supports uh, to, um, to the, the economic aspects and then trying, as I think we, we saw one of the uh, best practices that was shown uh, earlier on, uh, combine uh, economic uh, value with uh, with the social integration. So there's uh, there are two areas. Huh? One is the skills development and reinforcing that, and then the other is looking at the social aspects that um, an improved um, uh, textile uh, sector can uh, can bring. So this is uh, what uh, what we're planning for um, for the skills supports. Uh, the other point uh, was the digital product passport. Yes, thank you for asking me about that because I completely forgot. In the articulation with SPI, one of the main measures of the sustainable product initiatives will be <clears throat> very likely the adoption of a digital product passport. We still need to determine the shape of it and then at which point we will make available which information for which actor and so on and through which means. But uh, the, the technical aspects are, are all there, so the solutions um, are, are, are there. Uh, so we just need to work on um, some intellectual property rights and then uh, sensitivity about the, the information that we make available. But yes, very likely uh, there will be this digital product password. I don't know at this point, we don't know at this point, if it will be... Um, a digital product passports that will be the same for all the products or again as i indicated some specific measures of the digital product passport will be included in the implementing measures that will be adopted product by product but yes we are developing a system that will allow the different uh, step uh, the, the actors in the different steps of production and consumption and then their recycling to um to have available the information about uh, the material that are in a product and, and other information that could be uh, interesting. And the third point was on was uh, on the international, uh, right? Yes. Yes. Not, uh, so the not, social and environmental aspect. Yes. So uh, we are working also with other initiatives. In fact, I'm thinking about the Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiatives that um, is uh, aiming at strengthening the um, elements of due diligence practices internationally. Yeah? As you know, for um, the, the imports of, uh, of products uh, to the European market, uh, we have established this principle of due diligence in some sectors, and we are looking to see how we can extend it also to, to textile um, uh, products, but going through some uh, a horizontal corporate sustainability due diligence. Uh, so uh, we we need to see also the the shape uh, of uh, of that, and then which are the criteria that will make this due diligence. Is it human rights, uh, environmental impacts? Uh, so it, it's a it's a combination of uh, of uh, of elements that um, the actors in the supply chain at international level will have to to comply with. But again. I mentioned another initiative, huh? so the Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiative. You cannot expect this type of measures in the textile strategy, just to, to clarify further. And um, 
what uh, what else I'm thinking about uh, for uh, um, international law? I'm thinking, for example, of uh, some you know we're continuing uh, the discussion on free trade agreements with different countries that goes beyond the trade and investment and then looks at uh, at environment. But uh, this is a um, uh, um, an entire type of, of actions that that looks to have strong commitments from uh, from the different uh, actors, not only on environment, as I said, on human and, and labor rights. Uh, we we need to see if we manage to have, for example, a dedicated chapter on trade and sustainable development in the free trade agreement uh, that uh, that we have and that we will um, will sign with the different countries. So it is. All work in progress, I, I must say, and we really believe that we can work with the UN and then on G7 or G20 to to work on uh, replicate what we are doing with uh, with plastics. I don't have any specific details now except the process, but I think it's already something uh, quite uh, quite relevant and quite difficult to achieve. Huh? Thank you, Paula. I think that's really promising on on, on the international agenda, also re also related to. To, to all the textiles that, that that the countries have to have to gather and what happens with it and export and everything. So Paula, thank you so much for taking time during your vacation. You need to get back to the mountains and to the lake. That's really I wish it was me, but um, soon. So thanks a lot. I really mean it, it means a lot for everybody, for all of us here, that you come here and explain the process. It helps everybody to understand. It helps everybody to contribute the best. So I think it's really, really important. So thanks a lot. I'll leave you to, to that and let's con the continue. Will, this discussion will continue until March and also after March, of course, which is really great. A lot. Huh? Absolutely. And thank you very much. Yes, I really count on continuing after March for sure. Exactly. This Thanks. is where really we are going to come and then all the contributions like today's discussions will uh, will take their own sense. So thank you Excellent. very much. Thanks a lot, Paula. Have a good uh, discussion and debate. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks all. Um, as you've noticed, we're a bit over time. That was actually on purpose because I think we wanted to make the, the absolute most of, 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 of Paula being here as, as, as the key person from the commission outlining this. I think it's really important for us to understand that. So now we're moving on. We will be able to catch up the time later, so that should not uh, be a problem. So now I want to, to open up for a panel uh, on, uh, on design criteria. Uh, what can they help to solve and how do we get there? And in the panel, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Valeria Bata, who is program manager at ECOS, uh, the uh, Environment Coalition on Standards. Valeria just uh, spoke and is a key organizer here, so thank you for that. Before I give you the floor, Valeria, let me just uh, say who the two other panelists are. So one is, uh, is Baptiste Carrera Pradal, who is the chair of the, I think now quite influential policy hub uh, on textiles. And also Wouter, who, who is, is here, Wouter Dujardin from uh, from OVAM, where he works on circular economy, in the OVAM is the Flemish waste agency. So I think it's really great to have the, the three of you here. And I would like to, to start with you, Valeria. Please, uh, please go ahead. Yes, thanks, Lars. And uh, thanks, everybody, to, to take the time to discuss with us uh, today a bit more in detail what do we mean by, by circular design. And indeed, um, for you that might not know ECOS, so we're um, the Environmental Coalition on Standard, and we have a 20 year experience working on eco design policy and implementation. So, what uh, um, Paola was mentioning previously with um, taking the footprint from the, the eco design directive and kind of applying principles uh, to other product streams. So, um, we feel that uh, this approach has been uh, quite successful in the in the past uh, and it's very good to start the discussion from the beginning so uh, making sure that when production choices uh, product material choices are taken people are informed about the environmental impact of those and uh, that even designers are empowered to make those kind of choices um, that have an impact over the entire life cycle of products because we know that um, up to 80% of a product impact is embedded with designer choices. So which kind indeed of, of production materials, finish, coating, anything that you can think of. But also, I mean, we also know that, that there are so much social implication that go with all these kind of logistic uh, decision as well. So 
um, we are advocating quite strongly for a sustainable product to become the norm, uh, regardless of the of the product streams, uh, but specifically uh, today for um, textile. And we have seen that a combination of a push and pull um, mechanism has worked quite well in the past, as I was saying, with the eco-design directive. So with a, a push making like it, all the different unnecessary, inefficient and toxic polluting products out of the market with some specific mandatory minimum requirement and then a, a pool. So a complement those kind of minimum requirement complemented with a pool with better consumer uh, information that of course needs to be uh, relevant, credible and transparent. Um, so of course, we're not here to discuss about the huge uh, impact that uh, the textile have on the environment and the break next week that um, there are, yeah, the industry is, uh, is uh, gearing up to. So there is quite a lot of global consumption of clothing that is continually increasing. Um, and unfortunately, there is quite a lot of utilization that is decreasing. So there is a clear urgency to address and this complex issue. And um, we know that, I mean, if we start with minimum requirement, this is uh, hopefully a very uh, good beginning to uh, transform the textile sector toward circularity. So ECOS has produced, uh, we have published a report back in, spr in the spring that is called um, um, Durable, I mean, uh, that looks into how eco design principle can be applied to textile, and I will uh, put the link in the in the chat afterwards, um, where we indeed look uh, at how to translate our approach to eco design to, to to textile, thinking first and foremost about how to design different system. So not just the product in itself, but really have more of a, a systemic approach to which kind of changes we want to have. And hopefully, let's see, um, hopefully within the, the textile strategy, this will give us the vision and the direction where to go with this uh, systemic uh, change. And then make indeed products that do last long, that are repairable, that are recyclable, uh, but I mean, let's first things first, I mean, let me stress once again that textile products that are not produced are the most sustainable one. So the ones that we avoid to produce again are um, indeed the, the, the most sustainable one. And then, of course, the second best option is to keep them um, in the cycle or in the loop for as long as possible. So first of all, we need to slow down the loop hopefully with um, mandatory quantitative targets for material and consumption uh, footprint reduction and prolonged um, useful life of textile and then uh, closing the loop. So what um, indeed uh, uh, Paola was mentioning as well, so making products that are easy to recycle, um, making sure that the loop gets closed at, at one point. And what we have looked through in our report is that we went through 20 different um, voluntary schemes that are out there that have very good uh, already starting point as basis to look into durability, into repairability, into recyclability, into modularity, etc. And there is quite a lot of ideas that can be taken there. Of course, what I think it's important to pinpoint as well is that when we talk about durability uh, within the report, we have focused on some criteria that could be used to extend um, physical durability of products, but indeed like the emotional durability of uh, products needs to be tackled as well, which is a bit more um, difficult and a bit uh, more more difficult to define, but needs to be tackled as well. And then, of course, um, what what we when we think about durability, it's important to say that it should be achieved not through the use of persistent hazardous substances. So, making sure that design choices, the so weaving techniques, etc., are the the ones that will provide uh, products with uh, the most extended life cycle. And um, what I was saying earlier, um, when we say that up to 80% of the design 
cho uh, and choices and make the environmental impact is for everybody that is working here in design. I mean, the choice you make, so which materials you decide to choose, which finishes you you decide for for the material, which coating, which color, etc. I mean, do ask yourself the question, what is the environmental and social price of these choices? And are we willing to pay for it? Meaning, are we willing to pay for it fully or are we making society paying for it? So, um, of course, I mean, we need to focus on toxic free, on circular product material. We need to what um, Paola was saying earlier, we need to limit microplastic release promote raw materials that are sustainably sourced and ethically sourced. I would hope that indeed the uh, EPR for textile was included in the strategy, but let's see then. And um, we are pushing for indeed a product uh, uh, passport to, in, um, to ensure traceability and transparency. And actually, uh, last point that I think it's important to make in those kind of discussion is that um, while looking into design, so design, uh, production, etc., we are calling for a mandatory ban of the destruction of textile products that will send a very strong signal to production and to logistics, openly addressing overproduction. Um, I mean, when we, if we are serious about talking about a circular economy and value retention of products, for me, that is a uh, no-go, and this goes, of course, hand in hand with traceability. So making sure that you do have this kind of, of information to make informed uh, choice there. Voila, so that's in a nutshell my, my um, feedback and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot, Valeria. That was really great. You already have uh, questions in the chat that we, you can, that, but, uh, but I think what you're, I think it's really, it's really great that you are highlighting all your insights with us and also that you are constantly pushing the agenda. I like that very much, you know, the, the really the focus on durability, even the emotional durability. And uh, the last thing you mentioned, you know, the, the call for the the, the ban for, for, for destruction. And these are really pushing the agenda. I think it's really important you do that. So please, please continue to do so because I think it, it helps move the, the, the in a really right direction. Uh, the our next speaker is 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 Baptiste. I'm, a, I'm not 100% sure that Baptiste is with us. Yes, yes. Are you here? Yeah. He's here. Great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Baptiste, uh, welcome. I just introduced you. I introduced you. It's really great to have you here. As I said, Baptiste is chair of the, what I would now call the very influential policy hub. I think you guys are doing really, really great work also to move move this agenda in, in the right direction from the industry perspective. So, thanks a lot for that. So, uh, yeah, Baptiste, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for joining. And thanks a lot, uh, Lars, and all of the organizers for the uh, invitation. We Re really appreciate it. Can you that. turn on your camera, Baptiste, if, if possible? It's turned on already. Okay, sorry, so, I just can't see it. Okay. No problem. So um, I see Valérie, you said, so that I understand that everything good. So therefore, moving forward, so uh, thank you again for having invited uh, me today here. So, uh, and I really appreciate, Lars, uh, the comment you made about the Policy Hub, but uh, therefore for the people in the room and in the audience that may not know about the Policy Hub, let me first introduce briefly about uh, the Policy Hub, what we are doing, what we are achieving, and the different contribution we've made. And then after, I will be able to go down directly what the main purpose of today, to be able to to explain the rationale behind our proposition linked to the Sustainable Product Policy Initiative and some of the key elements that we are pushing forward as part of this um, upcoming piece of regulation and extremely happy to be able to go directly uh, in line with many of the points that Valeria has mentioned earlier. So first, the Policy Hub. The Policy Hub now is an initiative which has been launched uh, three years ago and which is uniting the global fashion agenda, the European Federation of the Sporting Goods Industry, textile exchange, the Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemical Foundation and uh, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition into this policy hub for circularity in apparel and footwear that aims to harness all of the knowledge and the experience that the industry has amassed in the last decades to be able to bring these um, learnings to the Commission and to everybody to be able to make ultimately the most ambitious and impactful regulation. We do recognize that indeed, if we really want to tackle many of the um, uh, topics to be able to reach a lower impact with an industry with a lower impact, 
definitely to tackle eco design and design is one of the key elements and that therefore this will come through a meaningful set of regulation that again are better fed by also some of the learnings of the industry. So to this end, what we've been doing is that um, discussing with our members that represent more than 50% of the world footwear and uh, textile industry from manufacturers, man, uh, brand and e-retailers. We therefore try to identify what will be the most impactful element. And therefore, what we started to outline is also, like Paola mentioned, from different, different stage in the life cycle of a product, from the way you design it, from the way you already design it thinking about its end of life, to the way you design it thinking about how long it will be lasting on the market, that there is some clear point here that we can regulate to make sure that the economy and the textile sector will be more fit for circularity. So first, starting about uh, and completely in agreement with uh, the first comment that Ecos made is indeed the product that not produced, which has the lowest impact. So to this end, this is why in, when we think about one of the first element and in line with the waste hierarchy that we are proposing as part of the sustainable product policy initiative is to be indeed uh, making sure that the product will be designed in a way that will guarantee the longer life possible that there will be better fit for resell and reuse, and therefore that the, the longer their life, ultimately the lower the footprint and the lower need um, to be able to replace them. To this end, we also advocate, therefore, for mandatory requirements regarding the durability of the uh, textile which are put on the EU market. What we think should be applied is uh, the methodology as currently defined as per the product environmental footprint uh, conversation that defines how to measure durability. Um, we hope that indeed as part of this methodology aligned with Valérie, we can find also a perspective to incorporate in plus of the physical durability kind of way to think about what could be eventually uh, emotional durability element that could make their way into this methodology. But in short, we really believe that increasing the durability of a product is a key element, that this comes through clear requirement regarding the durability of the product and that the method should be aligned with the PEF methodology. So completely aligned with this perspective, and this is one of the elements that we hope to see implemented as part of this uh, upcoming regulation. But then indeed, once a product is created and once we have extended its lifetime as much as possible, exactly also aligned with ECO's proposition, um, we also believe that once they are designed, they ought to be designed in a way that will permit and allow for the maximum recyclability of the garment. So to this end, we, really we definitely think that we have to define they and to therefore have regulation that will already have a pathway to identify as we see solutions being created, how to progressively limit the use of, may that be material mix, may that be some type of chemicals, may that be some type of processes, that could hamper the capacity of a garment to be uh, recycled. So also having in mind from the inception, uh, the end of life of a garment and ensuring that in the process which are selected, first in it as designer always to have in mind, is the process I'm implementing on the product, ampering is recyclability. And again, in as per the regulation, to start to consider implementing some restriction as uh, with the development of new technologies. But that's just one part of it. By doing that, you will be increasing the uh, recyclability of a product, but you don't guarantee that there will still be an appetite for taking care of the recycled material that you have to this end. So therefore, we've been thinking also about what could be a way to make sure that we can incentivize the market. There is many ways that we can be used, uh, that can be implemented via other legal vehicles, but from a eco-design element, what we thought would be a good approach would be to think at the level of a brand or the economical operator putting products in the market to start to consider to have mandatory targets regarding usage of recycled fiber per fiber type, which will mean that typically that if you are a brand that wants to put certain products in the market, in your entire fiber mix, in your entire fiber portfolio, you are using wool, you are using cotton, you are using synthetic, polyester, that for each of those fiber, you will have a threshold of mandatory inclusion of recycled content 
in, uh, threshold that will aim at being revisited regularly as part of indeed a collaborative dialogue to make sure that we can align the capacity of the industry to take uh, those recycled content with the capacity of the industry to produce also this recycled content so that ultimately we always also have a minimum market created to ensure that also there is even more incentive to be able to produce this recycled material. Because again, it's by creating this minimum threshold, we see already many of the leaders of the industry which are already committing to a lot of usage of recycled material, but that it's by also including that into requirement that will be implemented on the products that will be sold in Europe, that will really make sure that we will be creating this common market. And ultimately also having in mind that there is only one reason why we do all of that, is to lower the environmental impact of the products and of the industry. To this end also, we are happy to see how we can discuss and implement potential threshold regarding, let's start with, for instance, carbon emission at, again, operator level or producer levels for the one that will be involved and that will be producing uh, the and putting on the market those garments. This is still conversation that we put forward and that we look forward to engaging with many of the other actors to be able to make them more robust, to hear more perspective about how we can channel them. But we really believe that at some point in time also mandating a certain target, mandating an objective will be a way that can still allow some innovation to happen while guaranteeing the result and the output. So we hope to see, therefore, a combination of regulation that may be happening at the product level, but also at the producer level, putting the product on the market to make sure that ultimately it's the overall impact which is reduced. And here I have shown you some of the main regulations that we think on some of the main elements that we wish to be seeing as part of the uh, SPI. We also, um, you can access on our website the more complete position that we have on the SPI, and we look forward for further engagement with all of the different parties. Thanks again. Lars, the floor is yours back. Thank you so much, much Baptiste, for, for your, you know, your engagement on behalf of the policy hub. I think it's really, really important that you, you that you guys are pushing this. And, and I really note your, you know, the talk, your talk about maximum recyclability is really important. And also I thought the thresholds for greenhouse gas emissions, it's really, it's really, it's really promising. It's really wonderful to work with an industry who's actually willing to change. I think that's that's great. Uh, Let's move on to, to Walter Dujadin. Walter is from uh, OVAM, the Flemish uh, uh, waste agency leading on circular economy and, and, and textiles. So uh, the word is your, yours, Walter. Thank you. Uh, just a moment, I'll just share my screen. Um, indeed. So hey, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. And um, what I will do now is present a very short snapshot of a study we did. Uh, on the eco-design criteria for consumer textiles. Um, it was funded in part by Smart Life, so a live program of the European Union. So uh, thank you for that. The study had two main goals. First of all, to provide eco-design criteria for the EU strategy for textiles. And secondly, to broaden the scope of the eco-design directive, to include textiles by listing very clear requirements. Now, there are three main results that I want to share here. First of all, quality was determined the most impactful eco-design criteria. Now, this is essential to know because um, eco-design can be defined in many ways. Therefore, the study looked at the potential impact of life prolongation versus recycling versus responsible production. But because of the immature state of recycling technology and the legislative difficulties with responsible production, life prolongation was determined the quickest way to environmental gain. Now, in the next step, within life prolongation, quality was determined predominant versus maintenance and repairability. And I'm really happy to hear that this is completely in line with ECOS and uh, the, uh, the policy hub. Uh, they also mentioned that uh, life prolongation and durability are uh, top of mind here. The second part of the study uh, involved in a determining a very clear categorization of, of textiles. Um, so here are the seven categories, and with the first one, clothing being further subdivided into 10 subcategories. 
Now, this is also, also essential because for the next step on the right part of the slide, we defined a clear set of minimum criteria for each of these categories. And these minimum criteria are based on um, existing labels and their minimum criteria on the one hand, and on the other hand, on the experience of uh, Centexbell as a textile testing lab. And what I mean with this minimum criteria um, is made a bit more tangible with the example below. So there I show a, a shirt made from a woven fabric. For example, this minimum criteria for that shirt would be uh, it can shrink no more than 3%. The fiber should uh, withstand a tear strength of at least 8 Newton, and so on and so on. We believe that these minimum criteria can enforce a minimum quality level for all textiles on the European market, so that, all, first of all, textiles are less often thrown away. And if they are thrown away, the chance for reuse will be higher. Now, there are also three main next steps. First of all, these minimum criteria need to be reviewed in expert workgroups to further fine tune um, the criteria and testing methods and to validate them. Secondly, we need to create a clear communication framework to avoid greenwashing and confusion. For example, just to mention something, uh, we need the clear rules on the terminology of, of eco, green, sustainable, and so on. And we need some clear rules on how to declare recycled content. And thirdly, next to uh, defining a minimum criteria, we also need to define criteria for superior quality level. This can be done in many ways, but the way um, that we prefer is that we take a similar approach on how the, these minimum criteria were defined and then combine all the superior quality levels for all the different categories and combine them in one single standard. And then the EU eco label can adopt that standard for its quality level for textiles. Um, thank you. I will share the, the study as soon as possible once the, the layout has been finished. <laughs> uh, I'll so share it on the LinkedIn page and uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot, Walter. It was a really, I think it's a really interesting study. I look forward to see it. I like very much how you start with minimum criteria. Then you talk about the quality, you know, the clear communication, how to avoid greenwashing, and then you end up with a su superior criteria. So that we actually need both. I think that's really, really interesting. So uh, as always, time is running. What I, we have a bit of a Q&A now. Maybe, maybe I, what I would like to propose is actually that I I, I, I give you each the floor once, actually, only. So I first I'll ask Valeria to answer a few of the questions in the chat, and then I'll ask uh, Baptiste to do the same, and then you, Walter, if that will be if that will be okay, because I can see there are a lot of questions on the chat. So what I would like to say, you you answer the the questions to the extent you can, and and then after that you can supplement in the writing, because I think it will be really nice to answer as many of the questions we can, because that that creates a really important dialogue. So so Valeria, so I can see that you, I've seen at least two or three questions to you already, one from from Tone and also from Kirsty, and I think maybe one more, I'm not sure. Yes, let, yes. yes let me go through them. So indeed, I um, there was a couple of questions on textile in the healthcare sector, and um, uh, while that, I mean, of course, the report that we published was focused on clothes, I mean, in the healthcare sector or wherever, Texts that are used, a similar minimum requirement can be applied. And for the healthcare sector, I do know that when we are saying looking for design systems, design system is really making sure that products and even like um, medical textile, uh, textile that are used in hospital are reusable, um, that they are uh, they do have very clear guidance on how to make them reusable and safe so that they can um, even, I mean, when you were you were asking question about how those things uh, weight on budget, I mean, re using reusable option, and I'm sure uh, you do know there have been quite a lot of study, even on, on face mask and on how using reusable one up to a certain uh, level, uh, the, the greenhouse gas emission do 
get reused if you use them. And I think, Lars, that's uh, one study from the EEA that I'm, I'm having in mind here. But actually, so when you yes. do put together some reusable option and not just single use uh, one, you might have um, uh, a, a higher return on investment as well if they are managed correctly. Um, and uh, Federica, I, if, I mean, I will go through your question because I, I see that you have put a couple of them um, and uh, uh, respond to you then in written form. But also for that, I mean, green public procurement has a very big part to play, especially when it is uh, the healthcare sector and hospital and um, with so much of their budget being driven by public procurement. What we advocate is for clear uh, mandatory indeed uh, criteria also for for public procurement for green public procurement and for making sure that people that do make all those choices um do not have to provide a lot of other um information on why they made that green choice in the first place um so um limiting the environmental burden for the production process i mean of course we need to look into the production process as i was saying 80 percent comes from the design phase and so much of that comes from the production process so we need that there is a combination of having the ambition of going towards um or um less embedded um, impact, what Lars was mentioning earlier, and how to make sure that whatever you design has less uh, embedded impacts in. Um, there are some uh, documents out there that are already uh, spell out some ways to have production processes that are less carbon intensive, etc. But indeed, uh, this is, uh, I mean, uh, when I was saying that this is just the beginning, it is the beginning. We're looking at the start and hopefully all of these things will be taken care of as well. Um, and then, I mean, uh, the trade-off between the different um, criteria for durability, for use, for recyclability, we need to be very, very mindful also about like systemic shift and trade-offs, so making sure that whatever our vision is, of the world that we want to, which is something where indeed the, um, the environmental impact of product is less and then and the, the, the just the overproduction stops, then it's something that will be dealt hopefully at that time as well, but I will respond in a written form. Thanks, Lars. Thank Thanks a lot, Valerie, for very clear answers, and also thank you for giving giving me some some work to do on the trade. I can, you know, we are, we're finishing reports now on microplastics and also on design, but of course the the, the, the trade could be a, could be a really one interesting one. So I've noted that down, and let's see if we can do that. That's that would be great. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll now move on to Baptiste. Baptiste, uh, you know. Please uh, don't take too long, two or three minutes, then we need to, need to move on. If there are questions you can't answer here, then you can, we can do it in writing, all right? Thanks. No problem. So thank you for that. So just one quick, there was one question regarding the fact that um, how do we balance uh, the requirement regarding recycled content with the quality of the garment, uh, being like uh, to the point of Valeria regarding also sometimes some trade-offs. Here, this is why we thought that uh, the requirement would be better thought as the brand overall consumption. It's true that for the one that just to, to make it very uh, illustrative, that sometime when you have some recycled content, particularly on some type of fibers, because of the type of recycled process, you shrink the fibers and hence you have a less durable product at the end of the day. So sometimes that means that should you ask too much recycled content in some product, they may be not any more fit for the destination they have. So therefore you have two avenues. Either you start to define recycled content per product, having subcategorized all of the product regarding some destinations of the product. <clears throat> Are they going to use for athletic purposes? Are they going to be used for uh, daily wear, for casual wear, for which is a rather complex exercise or the other avenue, which is the one that we are starting to think of so far, but happy again to discuss that in further exchanges to see that more as a overall use because you reach the same target, but let's still the brand decide maybe some garment could have 100% recycled while some other because of the de destination could have a lesser extent. Happy to hear any more suggestion there. This is uh, the starting point. And then in one minute, I just want to quickly answer on one point of Walter. Thank you a lot for the presentation outlining indeed the, the, the quality. So completely aligned there. 
However, there is one point that uh, we just want to outline is that in our perspective, conversation, for instance, on how to measure durability already happened. There is one happening currently as part of the product environmental footprint process. And as we witness now, uh, for instance, in the taxonomy, there is, yes, another durability which is being ingrained. There is a conversation on the PEF. In your presentation, you called for eventually another group to redefine durability. We just ask that there is harmony between those definitions, that there is one definition ultimately on durability to make sure that the effort a brand, particularly SME, will undergo to be able to prove the durability that this very verification and test can have be used after for many other elements. So this is just a quick outline, but otherwise completely aligned, Walter, with uh, the message that you are bringing here. Lars, I give you back the floor. Thanks a lot, Baptiste. I think, you know, your, your, your mentioning of the need for one definition is really important, also considering the taxonomy, because yeah, we could risk having different and, uh, the, the, different definitions, and that would not uh, be good. Uh, Walter, uh, on to you. Yes, I will keep it short. Uh, I see that in the chat, Tone asked a question on that uh, one third of clothes go out of use of, uh, because of bad fits. Um, yes, indeed, it's, it's very similar to a number I have in my head at the moment. It's like 40% of, of clothes are thrown away because of either bad fits, holes, tears, color fading, and so on. So this is indeed uh, one of the reasons why we focus on quality. Um, and why we need minimum criteria and eventually also premium cri criteria. So this is exactly what is addressed in the study by saying, okay, all right, this, this shirt, for example, can need to be made from a fabric that will not shrink more than 3%. This shirt need to be made from a fabric that will not tear very easily and so on and so on. And this will uh, ensure that uh, the these large group of clothes that are thrown away just because they don't fit anymore because they they uh, get holes in them this this big heap of clothes will uh, diminish so yes this is indeed the core of our study thank you thanks a lot Walter and uh, thanks uh, Valeria Baptiste and Walter for I think really three really great uh, uh, talks and for all the questions. I really appreciate the, all the comments coming in through the chats. So please continue that because it makes a very, very good and lively discussions. And I can see that our presenters are, are quick and smart enough that they're able to speak and read at the same time and, and actually respond to those. I think that's that's really, really nice. Next we have, uh, uh, we're going to move on to circular design in practice. Uh, we're going to have a session with uh, Juliet Lennon from El MacArthur Foundation uh, with Francesca Romana Rinaldi who is at Bocconi University and Iria mosti Leston from, from Inditex, who owns uh, Zara. Before we start it, I would like to give everybody just an opportunity for, for a bathroom break. So please don't, uh, don't leave the meeting, but uh, we'll take two minutes break now so that people just can get a cup of coffee or go to the bathroom and, and then we, we start again. Okay.
Okay, I think we're ready to, to start, I hope. It's been two, three minutes. We have Francesca here, we have Iria here, we have Juliet as well, I hope. And so welcome uh, to, to all three of you. It's really great to, to have you here. Just a word of introduction first. Uh, Juliet Lennon is the program manager at uh, Make Fashion Circular at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and, uh, and used actually to work also on the very famous plastics initiative in the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. It's really great to have you here. Francesca, uh, Francesca Romana Rinaldi, she teaches fashion sustainability at the Bocconi University and leads the Monitor Circular Fashion at the Bocconi, Bocconi School of Management, if I understand correctly. So it's really great to have you here. And last but not least, of Thank course, we have uh, Ilya musu Lestan here, who's head of circularity at Inditex. Inditex is, owns Zara and many other brands, so it's really, really great to, to have you here as well. So. Uh, so basically, we're going to do as before, three speakers. Welcome to in the chat to ask questions as we go along, and then we take a QA uh, afterwards. Uh, we have this session with three speakers, and then we have one more session with two, two speakers. So I think that will work quite well. A lot of uh, lot of examples of, of, of circular design of textiles in practice and a lot of discussions, I hope so. So with that, I, I give you the floor, uh, Juliet. Uh, welcome and thanks a lot for, for joining. Hi everyone, great to be with you today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about circular design in practice with the specific example of the jeans redesign and I'm just popping the link in the chat so you can go and check more out about it later. So as has been mentioned and as we know very well, the current fashion system is broken. We're using resources to make products that are worn very little and ultimately thrown away. And as the drawbacks of that system are becoming increasingly visible, it's clear that we need to change the way we do things. And in a circular economy for fashion, products are used more, made to be made again, and made from safe and recycled or renewable inputs. And transforming the fashion system so fundamentally means not only redesigning the products of the future, but the processes, services, supply chains, and business models that will deliver them and keep them in use. However, this vision is still relatively abstract. And at the foundation, we often get asked the question, so where do we get started? And back in 2019, we decided to take an iconic product, jeans, that for decades has been at the heart of countless fashion collections, but is no exception to the fashion industry's take, make, waste approach. And we launched the jeans redesign to demonstrate that things can be different, creating products that are fit for a circular economy today. And I actually have one of the half a million pairs of redesigned jeans here that are on the market. As you can see, they pretty much just look, you can't see my face and the jeans, but I hope I'm big for you, uh, look like any other jeans. And I'm gonna talk to you about this uh, project now. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, great. So as I mentioned back in 2019, so in February, we gathered, um, we gathered insights from more than 80 industry experts from across academia, brands, retailers, manufacturers, collectors, sorters, and NGOs to collaboratively define the design parameters to make jeans fit for a circular economy. And we built on existing efforts by industry players to provide a set of guidelines with common definitions for the jeans redesign. And these guidelines define a starting point for industry to design and make products in accordance with the principles of a circular economy to ensure durability, material health, recyclability and traceability. And these guidelines really are a minimum bar established with the intention to be regularly reviewed and updated to ensure that the jeans redesign continues to drive the industry forward. And in the two years since the guidelines were created, more than 70 organizations from over 20 countries in Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, South America, and Oceania, including brands, retailers, garment manufacturers, and fabric mills, committed to and have taken action to make fabric and jeans in line with these guidelines. 
And from the first two years of the genes redesign, we've seen that participants have demonstrated it's possible to make genes fit for a circular economy today. 80% of them made fabric or jeans that comply with the guidelines and common definitions, which resulted in brands putting half a million pairs of jeans on the market that are durable, traceable, recyclable, and made using safe materials and processes. And while this number is just a fraction of the industry total, the Jeans Redesign project has demonstrated that it is possible to create garments fit for a circular economy today. And this was achieved through collaboration, both across the value chain, as well as within organizations, building knowledge and capacity, investments to be able to create the fabric and jeans in line with the guidelines. Um, some brands also piloted new models through which products can be accessed or produced like made to order. And for a number of the participants in the jeans redesign, taking actions within business and across the value chain to create genes fit for a circular economy has actually ignited discussions around developing other products in line with circular economy principles, with participants investigating solutions for garments, including chinos, jackets, t-shirts, and accessories. Now, there's a lot I could say about the insights from this report, but we've only got a few minutes. So I just wanted to mention that through this collective action, the participants identified solutions as well as remaining barriers and innovation gaps to be able to scale this going forward. There were some commonly applied solutions, for example, the use of organic content and substituting rivets with bar tacks, reinforced stitching or embroidery techniques to make recycling easier. Um, for other criteria, there were solutions while available, currently only offering limited style choices or being costly. So for example, disassemblable buttons and post-consumer recycled content. So still more to do here. And then there were other criteria that were consistently reported as being amongst the toughest requirements to meet. So that included identifying and sourcing cellulose-based fibers that were produced in ways that have nature positive outcomes. That was also hardware solutions that successfully prohibit the conventional electroplating, zippers that can be removed and reused or recycled without losing fabric during disassembly, and finally limiting non-cellulose based fibers to 2% to ensure recyclability while still delivering styles and comfort that appeal to customers, including jeans with stretch, was also one of the criteria that was consistently reported as being amongst the toughest to achieve. Despite this, this is, the success of the participants has highlighted what is achievable today, but also it's equally clear that there are industry-wide barriers to creating a circular economy for jeans and other products. Today, we now have close to 100 participants, including new organizations that had joined us, such as Levi's and Chloe, from 25 countries trees that collectively are innovating and collaborating towards these common guidelines to continue to drive the industry forward. The question is not whether a circular economy for fashion is possible, but what we will do together to make it happen. Thank you, Juliet. Thanks a lot for really starting out with pointing to the fact that the system is, is broken and then uh, you know, talking about the, the circular business models. And I think that the genes re redesign is a really, really fantastic example on how we can actually make things happen and make it work. So I, I, I really admire and encourage your work. It, it, it's, really, it's really, really great. And, and we need, just need to continue to overcome overcome the barriers. With that, I give the floor over to, to Francesca Romana Rinaldi. So Francesca, the word is yours with a completely different example. Thank you, Lars. So let me share the screen so you can see my presentation. You should see it now. And uh, I'm also going to go full screen. OK, so here we are. So let me tell you a little bit more about the Monitor for Circular Fashion and um, uh, research results that we just uh, published. Uh, so the Monitor for Circular Fashion is a research project um, and a community as well of companies uh, led by SDA Bocconi uh, School of Management. And for the first year, 
um, of research, we have selected 14 best practices uh, of sustainability in fashion who have started also to implement circular fashion activities, uh, considering the different business models, sustainable inputs, life extension, end of life, sharing and product as a service. I see that some of the companies are participating to this call as well. Uh, I saw before Save the Duck uh, um, and probably also some other companies joined uh, uh, later on. Uh, so what is the objective of the um, monitor, um, which are the main goals? We have, we have many, as a matter of fact, uh, but let me just highlight uh, the most important ones. Identify circular fashion KPIs to measure circularity, uh, define requirements to scale up uh, circularity projects, enhance traceability and transparency for circularity and uh, for this specific goal, uh, we got very close to UNEC and I will tell you more about it and encouraging governments to adopt an harmonized policy framework to support circular fashion initiatives. And we produce a yearly report to understand where do we stand and how we can measure and accelerate circularity in garment and footwear. And the first report, uh, as mentioned, has been published on the website of the monitor and uh, I will share with you all the links uh, uh, after my speech. Um, so, um, just some of the main findings. So, basically, we wanted with this research to uh, highlight, first of all, the impact of COVID-19 uh, on the supply chain and the value chain of um, government and footwear companies. Um, there is a legal section on circularity policies. Uh, we also wanted to highlight the main advantages and challenges of circularity, but also the trade-offs that have been mentioned already. Uh, so in the report, you will find, um, let's say, a rationalization, a sum up of um, uh, what we could consider as all the trade-offs, uh, but some other ones maybe will come up in the implementation. Um, so we also wanted to highlight and uh, define better uh, after uh, mapping uh, uh, the circular fashion business models and activities um, overall. And there is also a section related to technologies for circularity and technologies for uh, transparency and traceability. Um, so um, there will uh, be more to find actually in the report for a matter of time, I will go directly to uh, another important activity that we carried out and it was uh, the Circular Fashion Manifesto. So the 14 companies have signed the Circular Fashion Manifesto, which is composed of 10 collaborative commitments um, in joining the UNEC Sustainability Pledge um, for a higher uh, traceability and transparency for the industry. And I'm going to mention on the chat uh, also uh, this project. So the UNEC call to action is open uh, until June 2022. And all the actors are invited to join with a pledge with concrete actions and KPIs. And with it, with the monitor and uh, also individually players such as Vivienne Westwood, uh, that is part of the monitor, and uh, also Inditex that is coming next, uh, as a matter of fact, um, have joined. And uh, we met um, also in Bocconi uh, in September. Uh, in SDA Bocconi, we organized an event, UNEC SDA Bocconi. Um, and uh, um, Inditex was there, so it was uh, nice to, to meet there actually um, uh, before this year. Um, and um, they have already um, been committing with a pledge, as we said, and overall UNEC collected uh, 50 pledges. Um, so basically what we wanted to do um, with the Circular Fashion Manifesto is to for sure put there some commitments for it at each activity of the circular fashion value chain, but also to um, also state and um, um, actually implement concrete actions. And this is actually what the companies are doing right now. And we also have identified uh, more than 30 uh, tailored KPIs uh, for fashion, for the different activities of the circular fashion value chain, from eco-design, um, that is the, the key topic today, uh, up until end of life services. Uh, so, just uh, an example for eco-design, uh, one of the KPI was uh, the percentage of uh, multi-stakeholder collaborations that apply eco-design principles on total multi-stakeholder multi collaborations. So, for example, um, we met with uh, ECOS, 
uh, during one of the meetings of uh, ICES, the Italian Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform uh, and INEA. And we believe, um, we truly believe that multi-stakeholder collabora collaboration is the only way to accelerate sustainability and circularity. And we will continue further on this. Uh, and another KPI uh, was um, the percentage of uh, units that respect the eco-design principles, such as monomateriality and uh, easy disassembly. And we are carrying out right now an eco-design principles mapping, starting, of course, from the excellent work done uh, by ECOS and the LMA Carter Foundation. And um, the KPIs will be tested in the next weeks and months through pilot projects, and the pilot projects uh, are the results of the collaboration among brands, ingredient brands and service providers, and they will highlight the main issues to be solved in implementing the KPIs starting from the eco-design ones. Um, so basically, um, looking at the eco-design uh, um, mapping, uh, probably we will come up with some additional KPIs uh, so, for example, the ones on uh, emotional durability that was uh, highlighted before um, are very interesting to us. Uh, we just need to understand a little bit better which could be the concrete KPIs and how they can be implemented. So we'll get back to you uh, as well uh, once we have the answer. And um, another thing I would like to highlight is that uh, on the website of the monitor, you will find uh, uh, the open uh, uh, source, basically, uh, the KPIs can be downloaded, uh, they are available, um, and um, you will notice uh, that uh, most uh, of the KPIs are actually starting from transparency and traceability, and this is not by chance. Uh, we truly believe that transparency and traceability uh, are the key enablers and actually are the necessary enablers in order to sustain the sustainability and circularity claims. So this is the, the reason why. Uh, so once again, I thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you for your attention. And in the next steps uh, of the monitor, we will continue working on expanding the community and um, we will also continue discussing and encouraging governments to adopt an harmonized uh, policy framework to support circular fashion. And uh, uh, let me thank you again. And I will share now in the chat uh, uh, also the additional links for both uh, the monitor and also the UNEC sustainability pledge. So thank you again. Thanks very much, Francesca, and, and please do share it in the links. Uh, this is really interesting and important work, you know, I think on the monitoring of the circular fashion, the different steps you presented, you know, the obstacles and the advantages, and of course also the manifesto and, and the work for UNEC, I think is really important. So thanks a lot for that. And uh, with that, I want to give you the floor to Iria Musu Leston, who's head of uh, circularity at Inditex. As uh, as I mentioned, I'm very curious to hear what 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 you have to what you have to say and tell us. So please go ahead. So thank you very much. It is a great pleasure and honor to be here today. As Paula was saying, uh, we are a big family already because many of the people that we are here today, we are collaborating on topics very related to to, uh, to, to design and to product. So from the, the Ale MacArthur Foundation and many of the, of the uh, not only the speakers, but also the people that is attending, we are together collaborating to make fashion circular, having discussions like this one. Uh, also, you know, uh, with Baptiste under the PEF and, and as well with the Policy Hub, all these thoughts, uh, we, are, are, we are completely aligned with them. And so it is a good, very good representative of the textile sector. And also Francesca, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, she was mentioned, the work they, they, they are doing on the traceability um, and, and the, the circular vision and manifesto they are doing, as well as Valeria with the eco design uh, guideline that hel has helped us a lot about what I'm going to say uh, today as well. So today I'm bringing you uh, two examples, practical examples of, of eco design. Um, so first of all, I would like to do a brief introduction about what we consider uh, eco design and uh, what we are working on because this is an, on, an ongoing process. So this is very, very linked to the really the training of the designers 
okay, and to have a minimum requirements. And secondly, to have a, a clear vision about what we want. No, and and uh, we we have to uh, bear in mind always uh, production, the use, uh, the usage of the garment, the end of life, and also the packaging many, many times. Yeah? So we try to produce our garments, and, and we are trying and working to make them uh, be done with the most sustainable raw materials first, and always bear in mind the impact on LCA-based assessment uh, with the most sustainable production processes, uh, bear in mind uh, you know, the water consumption, the pollution, the pollution try to make them recyclable or make them to be used for a long time, so durability. You no, know? but this, as we will see, will depends uh, uh, a lot about the type of product. You no, know? so there there will be always trade offs between different options that you have on, on eco design, and it it will be great to have somehow how to measure really the impact of one if you choose one option to the other. You no, know? so today I'm bringing with me examples. Uh, about eco design or how we talk about eco design on materials and on production processes and also for recyclability. So, yeah, and after showing you the examples that I'm bringing here with me, also like Julia, so we, I have we have one dress and we have one one uh, one the shirt here with me, but I will show you on on the, on the screen. <laughs> so let me just uh, share my screen right now and. And I will explain you a little bit. Okay, so um, lessons learned, and this is uh, what we wanted to to show with you today. So uh, I was telling you, let's focus now on materials and production processes. So we have developed our own internal uh, standard that we call Joint Life. You no, know? so if one garment like the ones that I show you uh, wants to be Joint Life, and the designers want this garment to be Joint Life, and we have a big commitment uh, regarding the number of, of, of Joint Life uh, garments that we're going to have. So. That the designer has to select uh, suppliers with the highest environmental and social both things uh, scoring audits uh, about our internal processes and protocols. So just only those suppliers are able to produce the garments that can be labeled as joint life. Second, let's go to the attributes uh, of the product you now and always based on impact. We always base that uh, under an LCA approach so that we have a methodology behind and also an audit system that can very that this uh, have a, a, a less impact or if it is possible a positive impact no? and we we classify the garments under like three different categories care for fiber care for water and care for planet depending on who we are talking about material water processes or energy for example or, or co2 processes so this example for example uh, this uh, this um, this dress that i'm bringing here has the three categories it is a Join life uh, garment with a care for fiber, care for water, and care for planet classification. And what? Because this uh, has a, the, the designer choose uh, one of uh, the materials that we have. Uh, uh, we have an internal list of sustainable materials that proven with an LCA approach that have a less environmental impact with a minimum content. It's not only the, the material, but also a minimum content with a chain of custody that has been proven and with a certification on all the traceability. In this case, it's 100% lens in model. Uh, with all the certifications has been proved to, to be managed and produced and farmed from sustainable managed for forests, uh, a really protected one with a plan of reforestation and everything, and also the the the, the, the fiber has the EU eco level uh, certification, among others. So that, that's why this is care for fiber. Secondly, it is care for water and care for planet. Care for water, why? Because when we audit and we, we can prove that the diet and the print, printed meal uh, fulfills the cereal liquid discharge and as well the, the wet processing meal for dyeing and printed processes is recovering and recycling 100% of the wastewater. And then we have as well the careful planet classification word because we are saving 40% of the of the of the energy because it, it is being made by with re renewable energy on, on the on the factories. Yeah. And this is one example about what, how you talk of that. But we, we are bringing another one, another, another real case. And this is one of the biggest efforts we are doing about recycled content. So here we see an example of a shirt that has been done with a 50%, 5 0% of recycled cotton, but made by our own textile weights, by our own production processes, uh, uh, ways that cannot be uh, reused, that is not um, 
uh, byproducts of the production. We collect it, we sorted it per color, and you will see later on on the lessons learned that color composition is really, really important when you design at the time of thinking about the end of life and the end of use. And, and, and we are learning as well together with the designers and bringing them on the loop so that they can be aware of about what is going on and what is going to happen uh, by doing this kind of prototypes and this kind of, uh, of, of products that really have been made by recycled content. Because we need to properly sort, we need to properly find the recycler that is able, is, is able to really shred properly the fiber and then we have to spin it and work with the spinner to obtain a fiber that is really has the good quality enough to be commercialized. That's a real example. So both garments uh, represent a big effort from a sustainability eco design point of view and with a really good achievable price for the consumer because at the end of the day we have to engage the consumer as well on the sustainable consumption. No? And if we have to talk about lessons and that's why we wanted to tra transmit you today we, we, we are pretty much aware about the relevance of things like blendings, textile composition, the type of dye in, the type of fin finishing and the colors and how this impact in the end of life. We are trying to enlarge the use and we are trying to improve the end of life and bringing them back to the to the loop. And we see how important it is you know, to, to that because of the barriers that we, that we are facing, technical barriers to do it so. Second, there are some type of products that have specific difficulties. One of them is footwear. So footwear, the reusability in footwear has some specificities, uh, specificities and also the disassembling is especially complex. So the specificities at Eco Design, as Baptiste was mentioned beforehand, should be done by type of products. And and here, later on, we say we will see in the recommendation that the type of product could be based on, on PEF, no? Because we were all going to have always trade-offs when we go design. If we make something very durable, maybe it's not so recyclable. So that's why we need an impact approach behind this. And that's the importance of having a methodology to really assess and to provide tools to the designer to make choices, right choices. So there's really a lack of uh, available uh, good uh, quality recycled fiber for all the type of uh, fibers, a good quality and mainstream and with capacity enough and we have a special difficulty in really uh, closing the loop in post-consumer and we have to, to innovate that's a recommendation we need to innovate and this is what we're supporting to really escalate at industrial level mechanical and chemical recycling there's a need for industrial capabilities to really sort Cordell and recycle textile waste that's why we are really supporters and members of the business hub of, of the business council of the rehabs initiative here in Europe because it has to be fostered. We really need to, to make it mainstream. Now the use of secondary raw materials. So there's, uh, we have to consider the current available recycling technology, as, as Baptiste was saying, with settling requirements uh, for, for recycled content per type of product and product category. And uh, as a, a major uh, lesson, the, the, the need of methodology for really assessing the impact and, and settling the targets. When we talk about eco design, let's think about what this eco design, what kind of impact is going to bring. And secondly, the importance of material and processes as core elements, elements of the design process. Thank you so much. Yuri. That was really a, a tour de force into all your lessons learned, which I think is really, really important. You started out with saying that we are all a family, and I agree because we are all a family trying to do the same and we want to make it right and we want to do it the best and I think that's really that, that, that's really great and and doing so it's also important to hear from big companies to you what are you doing what are your lessons learned internally but also sharing with us with the others and so so thanks a lot for that I, I really and then I noted your your call for innovation you know in the end you know and I think when you talk about innovation I think about technical innovation but also social innovation just doing things in a different way so I think that's really great what we will do now is we'll have time for to come back to each of the speakers once just like before uh, time is running as always um, so we'll just gather a few questions for you and, and Valeria has kindly agreed to, to help me gather the questions we have a few in the in the chat I just that uh, if we start with Juliet I was just wondering myself you know what you've done for for for, for the jeans redesign 
can that be done for a shirt and for a shoe and all kind of other things? So that's one question. And then I'll ask Valeria, you wrote something a little bit similar maybe, and maybe you know, picked up an another question for Juliet. Yes, so Juliette, you have a couple of questions. One was uh, indeed whether you will be looking into other products to go through the same uh, similar approach that jeans, or whether indeed, as Lars is saying, will you be uh, able to scale up those minimum requirements to other products? And then um, there is um, Dace that is asking whether uh, you could tell us more about the internal thinking around the needed change with regard to the fast fashion business model, where new products are put on the market almost every week and part of the product due to our production that are not sold. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. So um, taking the first one on, you know, what does this mean for other products? So one of the amazing things that we actually saw through the jeans redesign was that businesses and organizations themselves already started to apply these principles to other products once they got started with the jeans redesign and that's not only brands that's also like garment manufacturers because actually the feedback and what we heard from them was by having these minimum guidelines all of the internal teams in the organization were now aligned on it's not about why we should do this it's we know what we need to achieve now how are we going to do this together they reported breaking down organizational silos that traditionally exist between different departments within the organization they also reported investing in training hiring specialized staff bringing in external consultancies all embedding circular design principles. And while it was with the lens of genes, that knowledge is now embedded in that organization. It, it's, not, it's not lost. And actually what we're starting to see is organizations already applying that to other garments like um, jackets and dresses and chinos and shirts and accessories. And as we're moving through um, the next two years of the jeans redesign, we have many of the 100 participants asking, how can we report on the progress we're making beyond jeans? So we're going to make sure that within the next reporting that will come out, um, we also have uh, that more highly captured. And in parallel to that, we are running um, a number of activities within the fashion initiative at the foundation on a thought leadership piece on circular business models, on circular design more broadly, which will both be coming out towards the end of this year, which will again help uh, scale that. Um, to the second question, which was, I think, about um, overconsumption. Um, you know, the reality is today the entire fashion industry is operating under the same model, right? Relying on more throughput and increasing number of seasons. And in general, clothing is not designed to be reused or remade or recycled. And so as we're seeing as a consequence, it's quickly ending up in landfill and incinerators and it's having this huge impact on climate and pollution and biodiversity. So actually what we need is all businesses to collaborate and innovate to overcome the barriers that are becoming increasingly clear to scale a circular economy, both at the design stage, but also then with system level innovation to keep products in use and ensure that the infrastructure that's needed is developed in practice and at scale to ensure that those materials and products are actually circulated. And then for policymakers to create the enabling conditions so that the circular economy can emerge at scale in the fashion industry. Thanks a lot, Julia. It's really great to hear that the jeans redesign is also used for other for other things. I was not aware of that. And and please keep up the great work of the MacArthur Foundation. Um, it's it's really good. Just keep 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 pushing uh, pushing the limits. I think that's uh, that's fantastic. Thanks a lot. So then uh, on to Francesca. No, maybe to ask, just ask Valeria to to summarize the comments again, if you can, Valeria. There's so yes. many, and it's uh, <laughs> yes. to have all of you. Yeah. Indeed. So just uh, from my side, as I go through, thank you very much to the three of you, because uh, that's been such uh, enriching just to see how these things are, are done in practice. And I mean, Francesca, for you, you were talking about uh, KPIs. I was also wondering a bit what was the process behind coming up with some specific KPI for eco-design uh, specifically. 
Um, and then, Ilya, there are um, indeed uh, some uh, questions for you on whether um, indeed you will produce fewer number of collection adopting the eco-design approach. Um, and also, um, whether do you think that uh, uh, EU eco-design directive could be a po positive for creativity or brand positioning? or whether you see this more of a restriction. And then another question on uh, the material, uh, and I erase for you, because you have said that indeed uh, material and composition is a, a key aspect, and um, there is a, a question for you on whether you are considering using um, investment to use a local EU fiber in your product as well. Uh, and yeah, let's keep it at that for now. Thanks a lot, and please also be in mind, all three of you, that the questions you're not able to answer in, in, in orally, that you can try and answer them uh, then uh, by, by writing an answer in the chat. So, uh, so that uh, Francesca, you first. And please okay, keep it to a few minutes. You. We are running a bit yeah. late, so we don't have to Just one minute to answer Valeria's question on the methodology for the KPIs. Uh, thank you for asking, Valeria. In the report, there will be a specific section that it dedicated to the methodology, but basically we uh, studied more than 30 um, reports dedicated to circularity in fashion, so that was the starting point, desk research, and then uh, we uh, carried out a survey to the companies involved in the monitor for circular fashion, um, and then one-to-one -one interviews with them in order to highlight the key KPIs for each activity uh, of the circular fashion value chain. Uh, they have been validated by the KPIs committee composed of two consulting companies that are part of the monitor and we are now testing the KPIs. So um, uh, the um, process will be the same also this year. Uh, we're carrying out uh, eco-design mapping uh, uh, as I mentioned. Um, so basically the, these principles will allow you to highlight uh, other KPIs that will be added and then they will be tested with the pilot project. Thanks a lot, Francesca. And over to you, Iria, on the questions. Okay. Um, uh, regarding um, the 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 overconsumption and to, to slow fashion and whatever. So just uh, let me just try trying to introduce that um, the level of speed does not determine the level of sustainability. So we are trying to do our best with the best requirements, uh, trying to have a, really a, an impact assessment beh behind what we do. And then really uh, to try to measure somehow all the impact of all the pro processes and materials and everything that we are using. Uh, this is on the first step. Secondly, we our business model uh, is a business model in which we produce in small batches, which means that we wait until the last moment time to make the, the, the order, just in order to try to really uh, avoid the, 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 the number of leftovers. So we produce one for selling one, trying to really avoid the the the, 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 really the leftovers at the end of the of the season. No, and but we have to be more even more responsible at the time of really designing, thinking about the end of life of everything that we put into the market. And this is what we are uh, fostering and, and innovating, and not only individually because this is not a solution individually for just only one company. Uh, this is something that we have to achieve between all of us collaborating and trying to escalate the solutions and we are quite fortunate in the sense that we are we, we can be the triggers because of volume to do really systemic changes and things that's why we are really uh, supporting pre-competitive uh, uh, alliances and pre-competitive solutions investing in innovation and and, and to try to really foster uh, new systemic changes and pr uh, production processes that really make our industry circular and regarding the the, the the material composition and and, and try to, to to fit them, just let me just point out that more than fifty percent of our production is being done uh, on the what we close close by. That that means Europe mainly. And, and 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 Turkey and and Morocco, but it's it's, it's on the near near term. We have more than seven thousand factories working for us, and a half of, a minimum half of our production has been the has been done here. And moreover, uh, we are working very closely here with with the spinners and recyclers and even fiber producers uh, to obtain new fibers 
with the lowest impact as well as uh, trying to scalate solutions both chemical mechanical whatever about the different type of fibers because we still have barriers from five years uh, now until 10 years to really uh, have a mainstream uh, secondary raw materials available on the market and talking about creativity and and brand position that's completely true that we cannot forget about creativity because we live from care of its creativity so when we talk about eco design requirements we have to think about the type of product and the type of usage that this product is, is going to have in the future trying to bring the eco design minimum requirements bearing in mind this usage and this uh, this um, uh, uh, option for the for this garment so we we, we cannot restrict creativity but there are some topics like recycled content like the type of blenders you are using whatever that everybody can cares about even about the coatings the type of coatings the type of finishes that you are doing uh, you have to always try to find out for more sustainable options but the minimum should be always be there thanks a lot area and thanks for answering it and thanks also for pointing to the need for systemic change and reminding us that a lot, a lot of the production actually, actually happens in, in Europe. Sometimes we tend to forget that. And so, so with that, I want to thank you all, Juliet, Francesca, and Iria. This was really a fantastic panel of three very nice examples. Thanks for the for your talks and for answering the questions. There's a few more questions in the chat. If you can still answer thank those, you. that would be fantastic. And with that, I would like to introduce our, our last panel of the day. Uh, and this is uh, also circular design in practice. We have uh, two more speakers. We have uh, Rava Amar, who's sustainability and impact lead at uh, Resortex, who specializes in recycling and sorting. And last but not least, then we have Martha Willis, uh, uh, who's uh, senior manager of sustainable materials and circular innovation uh, under the heading of global sustainability at the CNA. So really, really important player in Europe, of course. So uh, welcome to both of you. It's great to have you here. We're going to do as, as before, you know, uh, a, an introduction, a speech from each of you. After which we take uh, we take uh, we take some questions from the floor, and then we are getting towards the end of this. We will definitely end by by 12:30 at the latest, perhaps five minutes before, if if if, if we manage. So, thanks a lot. So with that, uh, over to you, uh, uh, Rava. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Lars. Let me share my uh, screen. I don't see it yet. Yeah, let me know if if you see it. It's coming now. Yes, it's there. All right. So thank you, thank you very much. It's uh, a pleasure to to be here today and talking loosely about the terminology. If you want to talk about if only sus really sustainable garments are allowed to be worn in this virtual meeting, each one of us will be virtually naked because sustainability cannot be achieved without having the garments fully recyclable. Resortex uh, makes um, recycling uh, easy and at a higher quality at, at industrial scale. So today in this case study, I will show you uh, our case study for design for this assembly in fashion industry. As we heard this morning that less than 1% of uh, all garments are uh, effectively uh, recycled and therefore the remaining 99% are wasted, incinerated or inland filth. And these uh, uh, shocking numbers are having a huge environmental impact because the industry of fashion is responsible for 10% of CO2 global emissions and responsible for waste of $500 billion worth of material. And what's even more shocking is that 30% of the produced garments are wasted before they even reach the shelves at the store, as 10% never leave the manufacturing floor, while 20% of the production resides in unsold inventory. Just to give you an example, in 2019, H&M was struggling with unsold inventory worth of $4.3 billion. And the problem is real and is difficult. Yes, it's difficult because garments are difficult 
to recycle because they have a bottleneck, which is the disassembly. The disassembly is difficult and we have for currently two ways for disassembly. Manual disassembly, which is expensive, laborious and time consuming, while mechanical disassembly is harsh, it reduces the fiber quality and render them only used to downcycling and cannot fit them back into the closed loop uh, recycling. So at Resultix, we are trying to enable putting, fitting the textile industry into the circular economy. Resultix can make disassembling garments five times faster by simply switching the stitching thread. Our uh, stitching threads can melt at varying temperature between 130 to 200 degrees. And when you manufacture the garment with those uh, threads, at, before recycling the step of disassembly, you apply heat and the thread simply automatically disappear. This with no cumbersome, no whatsoever on the change, on the design or the manufacturing process. And yes, the garments can still be washed, dried and ironed if needed. We are able with the Resultix ovens to dismantle 13 tons of process capacity every single day. For here, it's great. It's interesting. And then the question is, what if a product is made by Resultix solution? What is the environmental footprint of it? And for that, to measure our impact, we have uh, conducted a life cycle assessment to compare our solution to the current existing solutions uh, on the market and see really our impact uh, against those solutions. So here what I'm showing here in a snapshot is just a comparison of a, a, a pair of denim jeans uh, made with Resortix dismantled by Resortix as a second life compared to one that is uh, ending uh, its life in incineration or landfill. By simply um, putting this solution in place, the uh, per only one pair of denim, we can reduce the water use by 3,500 liters. We can reduce the waste by 80% and therefore reduce the uh, material loss by 50% and the CO2 emission from the material sourcing to end of life by about six to seven kilograms per each produced denim. If we want to translate those figures into economical technical figures due to the offsetting of CO2 and leveraging the uh, raw material sourcing, that means 50 cents uh, can be saved for each ton. Our, our impact and our target for the upcoming next five years is to produce 60 million pieces by Resultix Thread Solution and therefore dismantled by our ovens. Therefore, we are expecting to reduce the land usage of 82,000 hectares, the land that is currently used for those 60 million pieces to be produced in terms of cotton can be repurposed to used for agriculture like stable food and therefore produce food safety for 405 families for every single year. In parallel, CO2 reduction can drop down by 900,000 tons and water by 600 billion liters. If you are curious to know more about the comparison with the current solutions and what is uh, the footprint of the European market in textile industry, please feel free to scan this code and receive our LCA in the coming few days after lunch. Resortix is a globally patented solution and behind it is a very enthusiastic team that were working hard to make sure that all garments are sustainable. Resortix's technology so hot it will melt your mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rava. That was really inspiring to 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 hear you talk about how to make recycling easy. You know, I don't know if I don't know a lot, but you know this thing about just making the melting the threads and, and doing that. I was not aware of that. I think it's really nice and easy, understandable example. So thanks a lot for sharing that. I think a lot many, many could use that. I think so. That's that's really great. So with that, I want to give the floor to Martha Willis from, from CNA. So uh, please go ahead, Martha. We've saved you for last because then we knew that people were going to stay because they, they all want to listen to what you have to say. So please go ahead. So do I. Thanks, Lars. Yeah, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks for a great event. I think it's been great to see how much participation there's been in the chat throughout. So 
well done for everybody to make it to the end and I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to share with you CNA's journey for implementing circular textile design. Um, and for those of you that don't know, CNA is a global fashion retailer. We have over 1,800 stores in 21 countries. And I'm just going to share my slides. Here we go. Um, so sustainability is very important. It's a core value at CNA. And you can see here on the slide our new sustainability strategy, which takes us to 2028. So we've got 13 goals that we're working on under three wider objectives of unite and inspire, renew and restore and innovate and lead, all of which are relevant to circularity. Um, but within our mission to make more sustainable fashion affordable and accessible, circularity is becoming increasingly important. And specifically within our European business, we've committed to connect principles of circularity to seven out of 10 of our products by 2028. Um, but what do we mean when we say circular principles? Uh, we're implementing a number of strategies, actually. Um, that ensure firstly that existing products are used more and secondly that new products are made to be made again and made from safe and renewable inputs. So we're considering a number of strategies, a lot of those you've already heard today throughout this um, event, but things like increasing recycled materials and defining standards for eco design. Um, but what I'm really here to share today is the experience that CNA already has in implementing an eco design standard. So we've actually been working with the cradle to cradle standard since 2017. Um, and this is a leading eco design standard if you're not familiar with it in the textile industry, but also it covers other industries as well. Uh, and you can see on this timeline a brief history of, of the achievements that we've had in implementing the standard. In 2017, we were actually the first fashion retailer to launch a cradle to cradle certified gold t shirt. And in 2018, we followed that with the first C to C certified jeans. Um, but this year, we've launched our Forever Denim collection. Um, and this actually featured the world's first platinum level C to C certified fabric. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with the standard, I've just put on the left of the slide here the sort of impact categories that we're assessed against when we're launching these products. Um, note that this is for version three of the standard and version four is now available. Um, but so it's it's very stretching and it's very holistic. So I'm going to talk a bit now about about what was the product in the collection and how did we do it and what were the learnings? Um, so you can see some images just to bring it to life. I didn't bring them with me. I feel a bit foolish now, but there's some images on the slide of what the products look like. Um, so on material health um, within the product, we had to consider a lot of different things. Um, so there was extensive research that we had to undertake to identify what the most sustainable materials were, what the most sustainable chemicals were. And this was a really collaborative effort. Uh, between firstly Rajbi Textiles, but also assessors in the supply chain, chemical manufacturers and CNA. Um, within the final product, the fabric was actually manufactured with GOT certified organic fibre. There was no hazardous chemicals. Um, there was also a focus on, on water stewardship. So the, the, the process water in fabric manufacturing was 100% recycled in a closed loop process. And overall, the production process used 95% less water. Um, on the emission side, um, from manufacturing, 100% of the carbon emissions uh, were offset by renewable energy. What we also focused on in the developing this collection was material reutilisation, and, and this is where the circularity aspect comes into it. So we did make the collection from a mono material, so the, the end recycling was in mind. We had cotton that was the main fabric, but also threads interlining and pocketing. Um, you heard earlier from Ellen MacArthur, we also removed the metal rivets, which is, is quite common when you're looking at gene products because uh, they're very difficult to recycle at end of life. And we also printed the size and care information onto the garment using approved chemicals only. Um, and, and what's important here is also within this collection, we really considered having a robust material reutilisation in strategy. So we had a plan in place of which parts of the product would end up in the technical or the biological cycle at the end of the product's life. But also we had a clear engagement strategy with consumers so that they understood how and why they could recycle their garments at the end of life. 
Um, and really, there was two key enablers that made this happen. Um, firstly, innovation. So obviously, within the process of developing this collection, there were barriers to overcome. Um, notably, there's this difficult relationship sometimes between durability and recyclability. Um, so one example here is if recyclability, we'd really wanted to use cotton threads. Uh, but actually to make sure we could achieve durability, we had to undergo very extensive trials to get the right weight and thickness of thread so that it would perform not only in production to make sure there was efficiency, but also in the durability of the garment's life. Um, and, and what we learned really from this process, which you've heard throughout the event today, is, is the place that there are with trade-offs when we're uh, designing for the circular economy uh, between durability and recyclability. But there's also been great discussion today around, you know, physical and emotional durability and, and even environmental trade-offs. Um, so really, within developing more sustainable products, we need to make sure that we respect the complexities of textile manufacturing and take this very holistic approach to make sure we understand what the impacts are. Um, and then secondly, on collaboration, this was developed with long term supplier partners and it almost goes without saying that without collaboration in the industry, this product would not have been possible. Um, and I'll just finish by saying that, you know, I think all of the work that's happening on the legislative on the legislative front from bodies within the industry and also brands, I think it's a really exciting time. And we very much at CNA are looking forward to how we can elevate sustainable products within the EU, but also within the, the wider fashion industry. And then I'll hand back over to Lars. Thanks a lot, Martha. It is it is indeed exciting times. Huh? and uh, exciting times when things are actually changing we can think change things together and it was really nice that you presented your sustainability strategy with the th th 13 goals but also the the standards you're using with the cradle to cradle i think that was that was really nice so that you showed how to use that so what we have time for now is we will we will have give each of you a chance to answer some questions there are some questions going on in in the chat and i would like as in previous sessions to ask Valeria, just to, to see if she can she can help summarize those uh, and, uh, and and feed them back to you, Valeria. Yes. Hey. Uh, thank you very much for both of your presentation. I mean, uh, very interesting to look at, at those examples as well. And Rafa, I was wondering. For, so first, a question for you. I know that uh, something that is indeed for the stitching, but I was also wondering whether your uh, technology could be used like on logos or other things. And I've, I've been scrolling down the chat. There are some question about workwear. So is that something that could be um, dealt with your technology? And then indeed, uh, Marta, uh, there is uh, some question for you, whether um, within the cradle to cradle, um, there are some indeed uh, very positive aspects to it. Um, are you also addressing volumes? Uh, and uh, whether uh, you are within uh, the, the the sustainable uh, strategy that you have been pointed, um, there was seven out of ten products that will be um, with some circularity principle. Will you be looking more than into uh, recyclability? Will you be looking into which which aspect will you be looking at? Uh, voilà, these are. Let's sum it up there. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Valerie. And so, 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 uh, Rava, you're first. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah, definitely. Workwear is a, a critical part of our core business uh, and, and labeling as well. Uh, we are also not uh, only interested by having the whole garment recycled, but if we can extend the life of the current garment, for example, for workwear, if they have reflective ribbon, for example, and this wear out, but the garment's still in good state, we can just repair or so, uh, substitute by a new ribbon and keep the garment to extend its longevity. Definitely, workwear is a is a big part of our business market. Thank you. Any other questions in the chat for you to answer or not? Um, there's so many. The chat is so lively; it's really difficult to follow. But that's that's actually great. So, uh, no. All right, Martha. 
Uh, yeah, so, I, you know, I think it's, it is a good question and obviously all, always overconsumption is the elephant in the room where it comes to sustainable fashion ac across the whole industry. Um, yeah, what I will share is that within our goal for seven out of 10 products, um, new business models and extending the life of garments is part of that. So as I mentioned, um, the strategy and what we're trying to do includes extending the life of existing products, whether that's through repair, rental, resale, um, and we're not in the position to, to share anything more yet, but it's definitely part of the strategy. Thank you. All right, thanks uh, both of you for really great presentations and also answering the, the questions very, 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 very quick and firmly also and clear. Lars, can I, uh, there is a couple of uh, other questions as uh, we have a couple of more minutes maybe. So um, do. Do how well. do retailers aim to get products um, that is recyclable or mendable uh, back into the system? And um, does the CNA have a plan to create uh, only uh, C2C certificate uh, products or will they coexist with your other products? Um, okay, so I can I can go on this one. So um, I think with cradle to cradle at the minute, obviously, um, it's a best practice standard. Um, it's you know a, a a kind of a vision, but at the minute it's not um, scalable across all of our products. Um, the aim is that along with the cradle to cradle standard, uh, we will aim to to scale the standard. I think realistically by 2028 it will coexist because also there are other best practice 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 examples of circular product. Um, but we've already taken a lot of actions within the industry to scale standards such as this. So when we first um, launched our first seed to see collections in 2017, uh, we co-authored a, a, a manual or a guide for the rest of the industry alongside Fashion for Good um, to make it known what learnings that we'd had. Um, obviously, the, the idea of the cradle to cradle standard and with a lot of um, sustainability strategies that you see is system change. So definitely we are using the cradle to cradle standard to change the system. This won't be overnight, but we definitely are supporting its growth over the next six or seven years towards our 2028 strategy goals. Um, I think the question the on how yeah. to get product that is recyclable or mendable back into the system. Um, I think that answer here is really collaboration. I think um, we're seeing a lot of the minute at an EU level looking at um, collaboration between reuse and recyclers. And I think brands can't always do everything, but I think we definitely will look towards collaborative partnerships to make sure that we can get product that's back in the system. I think I think most brands already have um, partnerships. For example, we already work with a, a partnership in, in Europe to with our We Take It Back programme. So we're collecting and sorting waste. But I think there will be more focus in the future about what is the best uh, destination for that waste and are we using it in the correct way because we need to make sure we're following the waste hierarchy in these conversations that we're first of all encouraging reuse and repair before we encourage recycling. If and I, I think add... the first one was indeed to, to Rava as well for the for how do you make sure that when you you were um, giving the example of work where how do you make sure and which kind of guidelines you have in your factories to make sure that things that are repairable or on that you can indeed take out of that stripe and make it uh, mendable and reusable yeah, thank again. You. That, that's, that's a great question and I will add up also on what Marcia said because the question is divided into two parts. So uh, Resortix is trying to uh, put the garment as a part of an ecosystem by working and collaborating actively with manufacturers, brands and recyclers. So we are in a collaboration with a recycling hub. One of them is um, in, in, in uh, Belgium uh, uh, as well. And it's uh, the scheme is first for us to work on the unsold inventory that the, the, the brands have a full control on that part. But also we will have a label and as a part of the uh, this collaboration with all the brands, there will be a take back schemes. But this can only happen at a grand scale after the post consumer as well to add to the percentage of the whole to, to be able to treat the whole collection post and pre consumption is to have a proper policy to enable us having a waste textile waste collection properly uh, in Europe. 
Thanks so much. Thank you uh, both. Thank you, Valeria. This has been a really great. Uh, you know, the I really like. I want to thank everybody for 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 a great day. You know, we started out with hearing from the commission very honestly what was coming. I think it was really useful for all of us. And then we heard the the perspectives from uh, Valeria, Baptiste, and Wout on 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 what they would like to see and pushing the agenda really forward. And after that, we had really. I think five fantastic examples of, 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 of good practices we can all learn from. So I want to thank you all uh, for, for, for giving that. Uh, as we said with Paul in the beginning, we're in the middle of the debate. The debate will not end in March when the strategy comes. It will, it will, it will continue and we are family together. We should continue the conversation. Uh, I think what has been discussed there will be very useful for the policymakers and the commission and the parliament elsewhere will be very useful for, for the business, but also it will be very useful uh, for all of us. The slides from today will be available. Uh, there will be uh, uh, the recording will be made available as well as as, 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 a, as as a summary. So that's really great for those who could not be be with us. I would also like to encourage any of you to continue the discussion bilaterally, but also on the social media. Uh, on LinkedIn, there's, there's a page for this meeting where discussions are, are also going on. There will, of course, be more circular talks uh, on on other topics, on on textiles, on on all topics of of, of circular economy, uh, and there will be there will be many reports. For example, the European Environment Agency. We will also report publish a report early next year on sustainable design, also making use of of, of what, what we learned here. So, with that, I want to thank uh, the organisers a lot, especially the Secretariat uh, in the Economic and Social Committee with uh, Janine, Alice and Caroline in, in particular, you know, involving me and sorting everything out. And, and special thanks to all the organizers, especially Valeria, who held us all, all together. So um, it was really great. I think it was a long morning, but I think it was a really, really great one. And I thank you all for taking time. It was, you know, two and a half hours is a long time of, in our business schedules, but I think it was an important one. So, so yeah, please keep up the great work. Please keep up talking to each other, sharing the information and join the EU circular talks. So thanks a lot. I wish everybody a really great day and a, and a nice lunch. Thank you.